This is Randall Smith, and you are listening to my lecture on the digital revolution prepared for my designer 2600 class, The History of Graphic Design at the University of Utah, Spring 2020. The lecture is based broadly on Chapter 24, The Digital Revolution from the book Meg's History of Graphic Design by Philip Meggs and Alston Purvis. So to get something designed and printed when I started in this business in the early 70s was quite different than it is today. And people my age, of course, just love to tell you what it was like back in the day. And whether you like it or not, I'm going to introduce this chapter on just what it was like. So you're about to find out just how different it really was. To begin with, it was very difficult to mock things up, to visualize, to visualize what you've designed either in your head or on sketch paper for either yourself or for your client. Milton Glaser said he preferred keeping things fuzzy. And he may have believed that that was beneficial but the truth is, it was simply impossible to do it in any other way. Mostly, your client had little idea what it was going to look like until the first proof had come back from the printer. We would be resorting to about everything. We'd prepare mock-ups with colored paper and colored pencils, magic markers, rub-down type, photos cut out of a magazine and just glued into position, Sometimes we resorted to telling the client, well, just use your imagination. We drew things very large with brushes, black ink, or white paint, and pasted it up onto boards. We'd use white paint for corrections. If we wanted to draw a straight line, we used a rapidograph pen, came in different line weights, from a triple odd up to about a three points, it was a terribly frustrating device. It'd fill up with ink, get clogged up constantly, or shaking it, cursing at it. And if it wasn't hard enough to mock things up, typesetting was truly a nightmare. And it was the primary reason so few understood and practiced graphic design. The typesetting technology of the 70s and most of the 80s was photo typography. After you had your page layout designed, maybe with pencil and paper, at least sufficiently that you had some idea of what your column width might be, you would decide on a rough type size, just guessing what might be the appropriate size and the style that you might like. And then you take your typewritten manuscript and literally write instructions to the typesetter. But in order to give the typesetter instructions, you had to count copy. Specifically, you'd figure out how many characters were in your typewritten manuscript. You would start with the number of characters per line, and then the number of lines on the page, and the number of pages to equal the total number of typewritten characters on the manuscript that you were dealing with. The object was this, the object of this was to figure out the depth of your finished typesetting in column inches. Suppose you had a layout where you had two pages of type, maybe two columns, two and a half inches each, would equal five column inches of depth, and you did it for two pages, you'd have ten column inches of depth. You then go to a, uh, a book like this and uh, choose your typeface and base it upon a character count, the characters per pica chart. You look down the column and find your characters per pica number and read across to find your particular type size. If we look here at 
number 060 and set it in 11 point, then the characters per pica were 3.70. So you take 3.70 times the column width, which was, say, 20 picas wide, which equals 74 characters per line of type. And then you divide the total number of characters in your document by 74, equaling the number of lines deep of your typeset copy. If you were setting the type perhaps on 11 on 12, or one point letting for each line, that meant each line of type was 12 points deep. 74 lines of type times 12 points equals 888 points deep. And of course, everyone knows that 72 points equals about one inch, so you divide 888 points and find that it's 12.33 inches deep. You go back to your layout and find out that the depth that you had planned for was only 10 inches, and now you've got 12.33, and so you have to do something else. you got to change the point size, or perhaps change the letting, or change the column width, and refigure it all with the different characters for pica. As you can plainly see, it was a nightmare. This is a manuscript that's marked up or specced, as we call it, for typesetting instructions. And this might be 10 on 12 Badoni book, uh, 24 pikas wide, flush left, rag right, subheads, 11 on 12, future extra bold, centered. The numbers, the numbers down the side of this particular manuscript indicate the letting. You can see this is specced for additional letting to indicate a paragraph. Trained operators would then retype your actual manuscript, the very words, into a dedicated typesetting computer, together with adding typesetting instructions. It was kind of like HTML coding today, where you not only type in the words, but then you've got to indicate whether it's bold, whether it's italic, whether it's indented, whether it's centered, flush left, etc. The outcome of all this was proofed first by the very typesetter, and then they'd send it back to you in galley forms. This was a low quality proof. It would come back to you for a review and make changes if necessary. You decided after you looked at it for this time that you didn't like it, that you, what you saw in real form instead of what was inside your head, as well as the possibility that it could be too long or the size is wrong, etc. So you'd send it back to the typesetter. And eventually, you'd get back a slick. This was a long strip of typesetting, sometimes could be four or five feet long. This is all just for body copy uh, alone, because headlines were set on entirely different machines. Headlines, that is, about anything 14 points or more. And you chose that from a different catalog. <clears throat> because the type styles that were being offered for headlines were totally different than the types and the styles that were being offered for body size catalogs. Everything, that is, headlines and other black and white art that you might create, what we call line art, like logos, or in this case, hand-drawn letters, all had to be resized, because typically they were created very large. And after you had all of your things ready, then you would paste them up in position using T-squares, triangles, rulers, light blue guidelines that would help you in uh, positioning things on the paste-up boards. In this close-up image, you can see the vertical lines that were drawn with the rapidograph pen. You can also see the white paint at the end of the line used to cleanly stop the line where we where we wanted it. The Y was drawn very large with a brush and ink and then reduced with the stat camera. And you can see the indents to accommodate the initial cap that were called for in the typesetting instructions, but they didn't quite work out right. So you had to cut the type and slide it to the right to uh, fit it in. Same thing had to be done, actually, with the uh, left-hand column of type, which apparently needed to change from a flush left to a flush right. All pace-ups were done in black and white. There's no color that existed anywhere. 
the color was determined by marking up for the printer. All of the type in this layout, for example, was being reversed out of a dark background. So you had to think about the whole thing in reverse. We would specify the background color as a spot color, that is a Pantone number 146, for example, or if you're doing it in CMYK, you do it as percentages of, of those, uh, those colors, like you know 10% cyan, 20% magenta. They, the printers didn't like it if we specified more than a couple, or at the very most, three C, M, Y, or K colors. In this case, we wanted the inside of the letter to be a different color, so we'd write out the instructions uh, for that to the printer. Because all pieces of art had to be separated, you could do the inside of the letter, as in this case, P PMS or Pantone 146 or CMYK mixes. You made sure the different colors were easy for the strippers, which is the title of the printer, to isolate your different colors for making negatives by separating each color, often with overlays on top of the original paste-up. We didn't do photos at all, not even black and white, let alone full color. We never saw really how a photo looked in our layout until we saw a proof from the printer. At the printer, the first step was to shoot full-size negatives of our paste-ups with very large cameras. There would be one negative for each color. You'd add screens if necessary to achieve lighter versions of those colors. And then the strippers would assemble all the negatives into flats, which are these yellow sheets. And then these yellow sheets or negatives were used to make the printing plates. When it came to color, color photography uh, all had to be separated into the four color process uh, by filters, uh, one filter for each color, one for cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. And then the negatives were used to make proofs, one piece of film for each of those four colors. If the proofs were not correct, if it didn't look right, you uh, had to create new negatives and make new proofs. Plate burners were prepared for printing the plates, and pressmen who then ran the printing presses. Finally, you get to the finished press sheet. This is an actual printed version of what you saw in paste-up form. Of course, now with direct -to plate imaging, one person can do it all on a personal computer, with the exception of the pressmen who run the offset press. And even that is starting to change because digital presses have now taken over the low end of the market. Digital printing is totally different technology. It's terrific for printing low quantities. You don't need the technical skills that a journeyman pressman requires to run an offset press. So that's the way we used to do it. Until this baby came along. This is the introduction of the Apple Macintosh 1984 in a magazine ad created by their ad agency, Shia Day. So the access to the process of graphic design has had interesting consequences. I think I've mentioned before how as designers that we often hid behind the complexity of the process. It really gave us a protection against amateurs doing it. It was just too damn hard for most people to do. Milton Glaser at the 45th International Design Conference in Aspen, Colorado, 1995, made some interesting comments uh, on this same point. He said, quote, in the past, the design process seemed esoteric, highly specialized, full of internal rituals, and hard to understand from the outside. These characteristics are typical of spiritual and artistic activities and serve as a means of protection. 
The computer, with its unprecedented power to change meaning, has made the whole process transparent and therefore controllable. The computer is an empowering and democratic tool. The operator can achieve results that previously were obtainable only through the long processes of study and skill development. This partially explains its addictive effect on the user. For myself, someone deeply shaped by old value systems, all expressive forms that are easily achieved are suspect. There are many more bad examples of clay modeling than stone carving. Sue Milton Glazer's comment there bears repeating. Glazer said, All expressive forms that are easily achieved are suspect. There are many more bad examples of clay modeling than stone carving. The very resistance of the stone makes one approach the act of carving thoughtfully and with sustained energy. I think it's important to recognize both the value and the limitations of technology. So this technical revolution came about in the middle 80s with the help of three technical developments. The first major technical development of the 80s was, in fact, this, the Apple introduction of the Macintosh in 1984. My business partner and I bought this very computer that you see pictured in this ad that same year. And in fact, I still have it. It sits on the display uh, bookcase in our office. There was, in fact, not even a hard drive in it. Everything was stored only on floppy disks. The operating system, the program itself, plus all documents that you created were all together on a single disk. It was an amazing machine for 1984. The Mac had a couple big improvements on predecessor computers. Bitmap graphics that could take on a rudimentary representation of the form was really a breakthrough. Prior to the Apple Mac, typewriter text was the only way that you could compute and, in, and instruct and uh, communicate with your computer. The low-resolution dot pattern dictated the letter form design and the jagged edges of letters on Apple. The Mac also had a graphical user interface that was intuitively driven with a mouse, and that too was an innovation. The second major technical development of the 80s, about a year after the Apple introduced the Mac, was the introduction of PostScript, the page description programming language invented by Adobe Systems. This is the outline Bezier curves that could be filled in with laser printed output, as shown here by Summer Stone, the creator of this particular typeface, which is called Stone Medium. This is 1985. The third major technical development of the 80s was Aldous PageMaker. This was the very first layout software that used Adobe's PostScript. It was named after Aldous Minutis, the Italian Renaissance printer that we talked about the first, the first couple of weeks of class. Later, Aldous PageMaker was replaced by Cork Express, which for several years was the default layout program, but that was challenged by Adobe's InDesign, which in fact has uh, dominated since they entered the market. So these three related developments are a revolution of a magnitude that has really only happened a few times in the world of communication. Technology has brought graphic design to the masses. 
the whole effort really democratized the design process. I remember reading about prediction predictions that secretaries would become designers. I thought at the time that that was incredulous. But the accessibility of graphic design process is much simpler and more understood. Public knowledge of type itself still seems a bit astonishing to me. When I started out, no one besides designers was even aware that different typefaces existed, let alone that they had different names, because no one had really noticed the differences from one type to another. If someone had told me that one day someone would make a full-length movie about a typeface, I would have thought them as having certainly lost their lost their mind all possibility of logical thought. So last week we mentioned April Griman when we talked about new wave typography. Griman was into technology, particularly the Macintosh, in a big way. Computer output printed and pasted up as layers of lavender, blue, gray, red, orange, and tan, which overlapped and combined, made this poster for the Los Angeles Institute of Contemporary Art in 1986, designed by April Griman. I recall when April came to Salt Lake City in the 80s and talked about the Macintosh. Most of us thought that the bitmap pixel-based type was just too primitive and it didn't really have any design potential. But Griman saw the design possibilities of bitmap type. I remember actually going to a dinner with April in Salt Lake City when she came here. She, in fact, invited me and my business partner to visit her studio in L.A. and see how she was using the Mac. At our office, we played around with that 1984 Mac with its graphic capabilities, but only with bitmap graphics. This was before the invention of PostScript. My partner and I couldn't figure out any practical purpose uh, in real graphic design for that Apple Mac. We used it for word processing, uh, and that worked great. We didn't use it for anything specific to what we were doing in our design business because type just looked, well, it just looked like the type in this poster. April Griman didn't see that as a limitation. And maybe that accounts for the fact we talk about April in graphic design history, but not myself. We used it for accounting, for word processing. It, it, you know, it did beat the typewriter. So the last time we saw a photo of April Griman, she was bald. I don't know why. In this photo, she got her hair back, but little else. This is a special issue of Design Quarterly magazine, which was designed by April Griman. We subscribed to Design Quarterly, and I remember getting this in the mail. I would frequently walk up to the front desk when the mail was delivered to see, well, probably to see if we got any checks from our clients, but I remember getting this issue of Design Quarterly. It really wasn't bound together as a magazine. It was, in fact, a very large poster, and you unfolded it. I did so in the conference room. And it was a life-size life-size digital image collage of April Griman in this gigantic fold-out, this special issue of Design Quarterly. I remember looking at her there, laying on the conference room table, and I yelled up to my associates upstairs and said, you had to come down here. We've got April Griman laying on our conference room table stark naked. This poster was created entirely on the Macintosh in MacDraw, one of the three original Mac programs. Although the collage is made up of many different elements, they were all produced as a single image and tiled output on 8.5 by 11 pages.
This is the close-up of that same poster. Because it was so big, April says it was printing for hours. The bottom half of her body was mysteriously missing after an all-night printing effort, but she had some backups and was able to put it all back together and reprint the missing parts. So it has both bitmapped and vector images all mixed together. This is a poster April did for the Southern California, California Institute of Architecture. This is some two years after the Mac came out. It's a hybrid of at least four different processes. The Mac was used to produce all the type and all the rules, and you can see the bitmap character of the type. It's also used for the small images on the edges that have been scanned from photos. And the overall orange coarse digitized background and the central coarse digitized version of the ideal man. The color gradation came from another technology video paint box and early high-end video editing, editing system. And then some architectural elements were simply photostat paste-ups. In fact, the whole thing was pasted up uh, and sent to the printer in the conventional manner. This is April Griman's work in progress on a poster for the Museum of Modern Art. You can see a close-up picture of the Mac screen, and then below it a paste-up of the printout from that same screen. This is 1988. At first, the computer was just used as an in-house typesetter. We still had to paste things up. It took some time before it was producing entire pages, let alone multiple pages. 1995, the U.S. Post Office selected Griman to create the stamp celebrating the 75th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, which gave voting rights to women. And you can see here some layering and the transparency techniques used for both words and images. The words equality, freedom, progress. For images, we've got freedom marchers, the Capitol building, Supreme Court, trees, clouds. That layering is perhaps more of a cliche now with the use of Photoshop, but Griman is using it here to suggest the passage of time. A recent AIGA annual has two books designed by April. This is a 224-page compendium of projects by the faculty of the same School of Architecture as the poster we just saw a few about three or four slides back, but this is 12 years later. Interestingly, interestingly, I've worked with a new client recently, their company that produces temporary architecture. And one of the employees of this company also went to the Southern California Institute of Architecture, otherwise known as SciArc. And I told him that I was aware of his school in part because of this class I teach, and April Griman. He said, April? He says, he knew her. But he said, I had no idea she was part of graphic design history. I said, well, she is. So the spread of electronic media and computer technology began to suggest new ways to present information. Another couple of individuals that recognize the potential of bitmap type and computer-generated textures was Rudy Vanderlands and Susanna Licko, both of Emigre magazine. Rudy is Dutch, she is Czech, but both literal emigres to Southern California. This is the cover of Emigre 11, Produced in 1989, Emigre 
was the publication that Rudy Vanderlands and Susanna Lecco published. The two of them were really making strengths out of the technological weaknesses that most of us recognized but didn't understand how to use. They did, and it evolved over time into a whole new graphic language. Vanderlands called Emigre a cultural force. It wasn't just a passive, he wasn't just a passive observer. This is a promotional poster for Immigrant Magazine, 1989. This is the cover for Immigrant 10, same year. You can see how bitmap graphics uh, can be used and yet how difficult it can be. Uh, italics are, are, are tough. Uh, even this use of it even has a two-story lowercase a. This was a special issue as an experiment in unconventional information sequencing. Emigre magazine was showcasing the leading proponents of new typography, the new typography of the postmodern era, that would marry youthful rebellion and intellectual curiosity altogether and expressed it here in type and page designs that really challenged the status quo. Susanna Licko designed the typefaces for use in Immigre. She did it with standard Mac output from a dot matrix printer, the Apple Image Writer. This was before Panscript, Postscript laser writers were available. This is 85, just one year after the Mac came out. The names of these typefaces refer to the numbers of pixels that make up the vertical count. You have Emperor 8, 10, and 15. Here's a close-up of an actual text page from issue number three. They would typically print them out larger and paste them up as camera-ready copy to shoot a negative in the conventional manner. These used two new faces designed by Lico, Emigre 14 and Oakland 6. With the introduction of PostScript technology in late 85, bitmap typefaces became technically obsolete. But Lecco felt that the designs were still valid and felt that they captured the essence of the new digital medium. So she continued designing new fonts, simply still rather simple, circular and diagonal. It wasn't until a year later, 1987, that Vanderlands quit his full-time job and began Emigre Graphics with Susanna Lecco. This is issue number 11, featuring interviews with designers from around the world. A different typeface was used for each interview. Designers were also invited to design different pages of the magazine. Emigre had become not only an example of progressive design, but also a disseminator of new design ideas and theories. But Emigre was not liked by everyone. In 1996, Massimo Vignelli called Emigre magazine and their fonts, quote, just garbage, an aberration of culture, unquote. Of course, Vignelli was a modernist, not a postmodernist, and it set off a chain of attacks on both sides. The chaos of the new ascetic, blamed on emigre and others, versus the prison of the grid, blamed on Vignelli 
and other modernists. There was a lengthy interview with Vignelli in 1996's print magazine regarding the whole debate. Of course, with a little distance now, we can see that the work of Susanna Licko and Rudy Vanderlands is really rooted in the continuum. She's not interested in paying an overt self restricting homage to history, while other serious type designers adapted traditional methods to the digital medium, Vanderlands and Lecco were not satisfied just to follow tradition. In more recent years, their typographic task tastes have changed. Uh, this is 92. They did start encompassing more historic forms. We have here the typeface matrix, italic, inline. 92, this is from Immigre, number 23. Susanna Licko went on to design two traditional, more traditional typefaces, Mrs. Eves, which is a Baskerville derivative, and Philosophia, which is a Bodoni derivative. So, although these are more classical faces, instead of going for these ultra-refined, purest shapes, Lico has deliberately drawn basic letter forms that are bursting with real character. She's added dozens of extra swash characters and ligatures, giving designers liberty to personalize and invent the typeface in ways that a traditional typeface designer would never do. Although Immigre Magazine once said you can't do new typography with old typefaces, what constitutes new or old is a bit of an uncertain question. Of course, when anything progressive becomes popular, its rough edges are smoothed off a bit. Susanna Licko's Matrix typeface, born in 1986 in Immigre Magazine, has subsequently appeared in advertisements for Cadillac, on a McDonald's placemat, placemat ad, both of which seem like odd establishment sorts of companies and unlikely places for the anti-establishment and avant-garde type styles to, to be used. Regardless of how determined Immigre was to forge new directions, they were incapable of preventing appropriations by just about everybody. It was no longer an experimental typeface. They were just cool or hip ways to communicate now. But that doesn't diminish Immigre's impact or significance. In Michigan, at the Cranbrook Academy of Art, the design department there has been known for a very experimental and open-ended attitude towards design. Catherine McCoy and her husband and product designer, Michael McCoy, co-chaired the design department for 24 years. In that position, they evolved the school from a rational, systematic, reductive approach to design to a much more complex, layered, vernacular-influenced approach, much more postmodern. This is a 1986 poster for Cranbrook Metalsmithing Department. It's a staged photograph with a schematic drawing for the picture in silver and metallic colors cut into the photo. This is another in that same series for the ceramic department at Cranbrook, also designed by Catherine McCoy. This is 1987. And two years later, McCoy and her students developed a, a model they called typography as discourse. They argued that by layering and juxtaposing words and pictures, designers make 
compositions that demand to be interpreted on their own terms and beyond their obvious content. This poster, designed by Catherine McCoy oh, in 1989, is not your typical recruiting poster. It contains examples of student work, but also a scholarly diagram that McCoy called a theory of typography as discourse. She rejects the traditional distinction between reading words, that is, and seeing and images, arguing that designers should actively mix these categories of experience. She said a picture can be read while a written words can be objects of vision. So on the left side, you have the visual or the see, intuitive, holistic, simultaneous, versus the right side, which is verbal to read, you have rational, linear, and sequential. And it's interesting for me in particular to look back at something that you might have thought of as style only and see it rationally discussed in this scholarly manner. Since retiring from Cranbrook, Catherine and her husband live and work outside of Denver. I've been to their house, and they have, in fact, the greatest graphic design library I've ever seen in a private collection. Catherine McCoy and other graphic design educators of the late 1980s adopted the idea of deconstruction as a tool to reinvent visual communications. Destruction is an idea taught by the French philosopher Jacques Derrida. Derrida. Whether or not the philosophy of Derrida had the notion that his ideas could be applied to deconstructing page layouts or type might be debatable. This poster is a textbook example of how to deconstruct text into many pieces, but to do so in an elegant fashion. Graphic designers at the time had appropriated the concept with postmodern zeal. To them was an alternative model of textual organization. And like many, I adopted the style without really an understanding of the philosophy or perhaps an, even an awareness of it. Adding this philosophy of deconstruction, this study of critical theory to a graphic design curriculum makes design seem more important. It also flattered the egos of those who embraced these obtuse intellectual disciplines. You might look at this slide and ask yourself exactly what is this saying? In 1985, a British type designer wrote a college thesis called The Bauhaus mistakes legibility for communication. This slide is a variation on that statement. Don't mistake legibility for communication. You might ask yourself what that means. There is in fact a YouTube video by the same name. This deconstructivist idea was adapt adopted by many of the people that we're talking about in this particular chapter. Rudy Vanderlands, April Griman, Studio Dun Dunbar, and the two individuals we'll be talking about next, Edward Fella and David Carson. Here's another announcement by Ed Fella, 1995. This is an announcement for a presentation which Fella himself hand-lettered and for which he spoke as well. He said he didn't want to impose on the prerogative of whoever was designing the presentation announcing his own speaking event. He called this his after-the-fact mini-posters. These posters were made to give to those who attended the events. And since he made the posters for people that came in to the event, he had more creative freedom because he did not have to make it appeal to any particular audience, time, or place. He has a very personal, eccentric letter forms, and they're just fun to look at. He did something very similar when he spoke 
in the Salt Lake chapter of the AIGA. Editorial designers in the early 90s, 90s started to apply some of their own personal explorations in graphic design to specialized magazines. David Carson, untrained formally, actually a professional surfer, became art director of a series of publications appealing to surfers, skateboarders, and the youth culture. He really flouted design conventions, ignoring grids, which are typically important in magazine design, and he really sometimes was challenging legibility. This is an article on a New York public swimming pool titled Hanging on Carmine Street, 1991, from Beach Culture Magazine. David Carson went to Ray Gun Magazine in 1992, and he used both computer-manipulated photographs, combining them with white and dark shapes, an unusual layout. This is also from Ray Gun Magazine, 1994. Unusual photograph, photographic cropping, deconstructed headlines relating to the musicians that they were writing in about. This is 1993. Carson becomes even more adventurous. He actually reverses the title Super Chunk out of the body copy. Entire sections of text are disappearing and chunks are being created. David Carson claims that it's still readable, although that seems highly debatable to me. Nineteen ninety five, another magazine cover. David Carson really loved chance occurrences that occur to all of us in the design process. But he looked for those and used them. Ray Gun was the first magazine he designed digitally as electronic files. The previous four magazines were designed all and pasted up by hand from computer generated type. The author of our textbook said that Meigs was not in essence a graphic designer, but more of a graphic artist performing on a stage. David Carson has a good TED talk as well. Rolling Stone has often been a leading edge design publication, or at least when it was under the direction of the amazing Fred Woodward. This is uh, a 1990, 1990 article on Sinead O'Connor and uh, an amazing three-page layout here with um, that O jumping from one page to another. This is quite different than Ray Gun Magazine, Fred Woodward's approach to Rolling Stone. In, concert, in contrast to David Carson or to April Griman, who were both striving for modernity, Rolling Stone instead pillages graphic design heritage in detail with interesting typography and hand lettering. Obviously, these blocky sans-serif letters were meant to evoke Russian constructivism. Rachenko in particular. You add in those reversed letter B's, R's, and K, it kind of suggests the Kyrillic alphabet that's used in Russia, along with that very iconic red and black color pattern. 
Here's Fred Woodward for U2 cover 1993 using old woodcut letter faces. When Fred Woodward would approach any design assignment, his typeface selection, its manipulation in the computer, the color palette are all meant to express the content of that particular article. Woodward also hired great illustrators. This is an article on Man of the Year, David Letterman, 1995. Um, despite the uh, abstractness of the illustration, Dave Letterman is recognizable there. And combining that with those uh, broad, flat shapes of interlocking color in the typography makes for a terrific layout. Woodward prefers to never use a typeface in the feature section more than once. All of his choices of typeface, the treatment, the color, the image, all came about from some kind of an association with the article that he was designing. This is 1995, spread on Alanis Morissette. This is the premier issue of Wired magazine. The contents page, together with the mission statement, uh, publishing mission statement. This is March 1994. This was really the voice of the information age, personal computers and the internet in 1994. The co-founders and art directors of Wired Magazine are our own Park City-based designers, John Plunkett and Barbara Kerr. The publisher's manifesto of Wired's editorial mission was conveyed by the text of the opening paragraph from Marshall McLuhan's popular 1967 book, The Medium is the Message. In Wired Magazine, postmodern text designs and fluorescent colors signaled a new paradigm for print communications about this new electronic media. The electronic word sections used layered forms and text often running over layers of images to express the multi-dimensional dimensional content of the internet and the shape of the reader's experience when attempting to navigate the printed page. Again, another spread designed by John Plunkett, Barbara Kerr as directors and designers and art directors. Photograph of the musician David Byrne using these abstracted photography and fluorescent inks, really capturing the the feel of the electronic world on paper. This is August 1997 issue. It's from my own stash of Wired magazines. I was cleaning up my office and found a stack of them dating back to the late 90s and shot a few pics just for our class. This is some of those fluorescent colors on the cover Here's another version of that opening spread where they would make visual verbal statements. This is 1997. Actually went to lunch with John Plunk Plunkett and Barbara Kerr in Park City six, six, seven years ago. They told me how they had designed not only Wired Magazine, but the world's first commercial website. Personal websites had existed before, but there had been nothing created in behalf of a business. And they had done so for Hot Wired in 94. Hot Wired was the name of the magazine's website. Interestingly, they, they even sold an ad on Hot Wired, that very first commercial website 
to AT&T, but AT&T didn't even have a website to link to. And so John Plunkett had to design a home page for AT&T as well. Plunkett and Kerr and the partners sold the magazine to Condé Nast, who still publishes it today. Until a few years ago, Kit Heinrichs was a partner at Pentagram and had been for some 25 years in the San Francisco office. Kit Heinrichs was known for his editorial work, his knowledge of printing and typography. In fact, he designs and publishes a cool calendar each year with a different typeface for each month. But in 1993, Heinrichs co-founded At Issue, the Journal of Business and Design. And I remember through our local paper supplier, I'd like to get extra copies of this magazine and share it with our clients because it had a lot of good content about design in the business world. It was uh, published by a paper supplier. Kit Hendricks also designed the Design Within Reach logo and catalog. Design with reach, Within Reach is that modern furniture company. Kit Heinrichs is a alumni of the Art Center. And this design is very typical of Heinrichs' work. In the late 90s, I was doing a lot of work for a local high-tech company. When they had a IPO, I was expecting to do the annual report of this particular tech company because I had been doing all their other work. But as they say, a prophet has no honor in his own country because when it came time for this local tech company to do, to do their annual report, they went and hired Kit Heinrichs from San Francisco to do it. Abbott Miller, together with Ellen Lupton, formed a studio named Design Writing Research. And as the name suggests, they pursue designer as author. And Lupton is the author. Uh, was just here at the University of Utah uh, about three or four years ago. She is, in fact, the author of the book Thinking with Type, a textbook I used for teaching typography. Abbott Miller, her partner, joined Pentagram's New York office in 1999 where he does a lot of editorial design, including this publication for a visual and performing arts organization. With the notable magazine Masthead Twice, How to Pass, Kick, Fall, and Run, this is 2007. Small digital type foundries competed with these large type developers like Adobe, Emma Gray has continued to distribute and design new typefaces, many of them rather novel and idiosyncratic. Choosing more traditional designers to take up sides against the use of these odd faces. We already mentioned that Loco designed two important revivals, Mrs. Eve's a Baskerville interpretation and Philosophia, a Bedoni-like interpretation, those two at the bottom both of which are personal favorites of mine. Matthew Carter has been called the most important type designer of the modern time, and millions use his work every day, even though they may not be aware of it. He designed Bell Centennial, ITC Galliard, Snell Rahound, Verdana, Verdana, which is on, I think, almost every computer, and custom typefaces for Yale University, MoMA, this face for the Walker Art Center. This face has map snap on serifs to change the character of the basic font. 
We've mentioned Jonathan Hepler before in our conversations and his former business partner, at least before they started suing each other after a breakup. They designed custom typefaces for Rolling Stone, Harper's Bazaar, New York Times, Sports Illustrated, and Esquire. And when those licenses expire, they then sell those typefaces to the general public. And before Heffler, before the split, Heffler was partners with Tobias Farrah Jones, uh, the designer of this ubiquitous Gotham typeface. Gotham was created originally for GQ magazine, and it was inspired by New York City type on buildings from the 30s. And it was used as the corporate typeface for Obama's presidential campaign, which many design critics noted for its amazing consistency in managing the difficulty of a presidential campaign. The URL for Jonathan Hepler's company is typography dot com and it continues one of the most respected and prolific type developers around. Interestingly, Wikipedia also attributes Jonathan Heffler to the design of the current word mark for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints. Although there is some debate about that, which I could detail for you, but it's a complex story. At least that was the case until just a week ago. Uh, a week or two ago when the church changed their logo. Digital imaging and manipulation are very common today, primarily with Photoshop, so we don't even think about how unique it was at one time. Before the advent of the Mac, the creative potential of electronic technology was seldom explored because only because the only systems that could do it were expensive mainframe computers. This is a 1992 image for MTV created by exploring the editing channels in a TV studio. This is another very early exploration of digital imaging, a 1987 poster by April Griman. It's kind of a combination of digitized images using an early program called Paintbox. These uncommon montages from the 1980s are a little bit pas passe these days. We're not going to dwell on contemporary digital mediums very much, except to show at least one example of the primary vehicles of interactive media. Back in 1995, disc-based disc images uh, and design on CD-ROMs were popular before broadband allowed the same thing to occur over the web. Visibility Interactive was a CD-ROM, and these were screen designs from 1995. Me and my business partners used to do a lot of these CD-ROMs, but really they're a brochure on CD in 1999 through 2001. Now, of course, this all happens on websites. This is a CD designed by MetaDesign in their San Francisco office. MetaDesign is an international design firm started and once headed by the German designer Eric Spiekermann, who you may might remember from the Helvetica movie. Eric Speakerman designed Meta, which was really the Helvetica of the 90s. Thankfully, that's over. I remember students at the AIGA Student Portfolio Review in the 90s, and it was all seemingly in Meta. Speakerman designed many other faces, including this one, Axel also founded the online typeface distributor Fontshop in 1988, from whom 
I have bought in a number of fonts. In the early days of the web, design was much more difficult. HTML defaults and the limitations were difficult to overcome. And when designers were involved, it was, it was a challenge. A good share of the time, they weren't involved at all. Much of the design was instead created by software engineers. Jessica Halfen worked for the Discovery Channel in 1994 and demonstrated what designers could bring to the table when they were allowed to do so, organizing content with some interesting typography. Archetype, which was the name of a design studio headed by Clement Mock, uh, did some work for QVC, indicating screen categories for internet shopping here in 1995. Clement Mock was the one-time Apple employee and former president of the AIGA National, and he was an early advocate for the designer's role in creating interactive media. This 1995 design for QVC has these drawers and cubby-like holes. Digital technologies have allowed designers to work more like illustrators. They can create images with digital collages. These are pieces created for Wired magazine by Eric Adegard of MAD design. Adegard combined a collage of currency and financial data to illustrate money in the information age. Adegard also designed this logo for Hotbot 1996. Hotbot was the first commercial search engine, the very first Google in essence. It was launched by Wired Magazine in 96. This logo, designed by Adegard, owes a lot to Rodchenko and the Russian constructivists. When I was in college, of course, music was packaged in these huge 12-inch square canvases for design, at least. That's what I thought the album represented. So I can't help but be a little dismayed when that 12 inch has shrunk down to CD size and then down into one inch on your iPhone. This is an iPod touch. Unlike others, however, I have kept my entire vinyl collection and I own a turntable. So I'm pleased to see the recent interest in vinyl and digital releases simultaneously and welcome that as a positive direction. But of course, the development of mobile devices has provided a whole new design medium. It's required designers to cooperate with software developers on how to design interfaces that can accommodate a lot of information in small spaces. With the introduction of the iPad as an intermediate form factor, it allowed much more graphic impact than a phone. This is Martha Stewart's effort in a 2010 edition of Living magazine. The cover featured an animated shot of a peona, peony blooming over a 10-hour period. Unlike during Saul Bass's time, digital convergence has brought creation of movie titles within the reach of a graphic designer and his desktop. This is the movie Seven, created by Kyle Cooper of Imaginary Forces. This is 1995. For many, the nirvana of unified art forms may be the movie title because it contains narrative, drama, 
music and graphic design all in one. This is designed at its very most expressive. Fulfills the basic function in that it names the title, director, and actors, but also acts like an overture, an introduction to the themes in the film. Again, these are more from the title sequence of Seven in 1995. Seven was one of the first for Kyle Cooper, but he includes many others in his portfolio, like Spider-Man here in uh, 2002, Unlike film trailers, which are edited with marketing objectives in mind, film title sequences are not under those same constraints because they're designed for people who've already purchased a ticket. So the graphic designer who works with these generic enjoy a freedom few other commercial artists possess. The recent TV program that it's very close to home is that which was designed by Kyle Cooper for Madman, the advertising and design company and profession, which according to a review in Time magazine last year, even referenced the Saul Bass-like opening sequence of Mad Men. I wondered if I read it if the average Time magazine reader was even familiar with Saul Bass. Stephen Butcher is a logo designer and typographer who created the titles for this 2007 film. This was his first motion picture opening sequence. Just a minimalist series of titles that blend with the images. With a master's in architecture from Harvard and another master's in media arts at MIT, Lisa Strassfield founded a company with a couple classmates in 96, which she then sold in order to become a partner at Pentagram in 2002. Lisa Strassfield works on websites, software prototypes, and with her architecture degree, not surprisingly, creates a lot of environmental graphics with typography. This is for the Bloomberg headquarters in New York City, where Michael Bloomberg was the former mayor and more recently spent millions running for president. Lisa's partner at Pentagram is Paula Scheer who has also created some significant examples of typography in the built environment. This is for the new 42nd Street Studios, with words spilling onto floors, ceilings, and walls. This is 2000. Singingly, we come back to polish here, off and on throughout the semester, doing so this last time for the Lucent Technology Center for Arts Education, a building in Newark, New Jersey. Paula first had the building painted white and then decorated it with just this one single typeface. This is 2001. Using type for much more than what it says the New York Public Theater has been transformed by the visual identity created by Paula Shear with a program of posters, flyers, banners, billboards, and stationery. It's a mix of letter forms, different directions, contrasting scales, all fitted together like puzzle pieces. 1994. So her work for the Public Theater recalls old letterpress posters where all of the available space was crammed with whatever size letters could fill. Ninety-five, ninety-six season of the public theater. 
This is an iconic almost poster. It has been published and recognized many times over. This is Cher's work for Diva is Dismissed, 1994. And the Shakespeare F Festival, The Tempest, 1995. Another in this series, 2009. The basis of the visual language that Paula Scheer employs is really rooted in her study and observation, interpretation of preceding visual styles. She remixes influences from constructivism, Dada, futurism, the Bauhaus, and even lowbrow vernacular typographic style of classic boxing posters. You can see how seamlessly the ladder in the bottom right fits in with three other Polishier design posters. Polishier has a part in the Netflix series called Abstract, The Art of Design. You should watch that if you haven't seen it on Netflix. Of course, we've seen this before, and whether this qualifies as homage, parody, or plagiarism has and will continue to be debated. Milton Glaser recently criticized Shepard Ferry, the street artist, behind the Obey graphics, Glazer complained of the many unreferenced references in Shepard Ferry's artwork. Specifically, he cited this, which is clearly derivative of another Swiss designer, Joseph Mueller Brockman. Milton Glazer said, quote, I think unless you're modifying it and making it your own, you're on very tenuous ground. It's a dangerous example for students if they see that appropriating people's work is the path to success. Simply reproducing the work of others robs you of your imagination and form-making abilities. Shepard Ferry has long been criticized for having a large body of his work built upon that of other artists, and he never or almost always does so without acknowledgement. But of course, that's not the most famous Shepard Ferry plagiarism controversy. Shepard Ferry designed this famous Hope poster first as an unofficial self-published poster that he created in just a single day. But later on, with the approval of his campaign, the image became one of the most widely recognized symbols of President Obama's campaign message. But Ferry said he had just Googled an image of Obama and he had worked from that. But just because you found it on the internet doesn't mean it's free or free to use. In fact, all rights are retained by the original creator or photographer regardless of whether you found it. So the Associated Press sued Shepard Ferry for compensation. And at first, Ferry denied that he had copied and even falsified some of his records to suggest that. But later on, he was caught, as they seemingly always are, and he admitted it, that it was true, and they had to settle, but they did so out of court. Ferry did plead guilty in New York federal court to destroying and fabricating documents, and during his legal battle with the Associated Press, he was given the a twenty five thousand dollar fine and ordered to provide three hundred hours of community service. So be careful where you get your images. Jennifer Morla formed Morla Design in nineteen eighty four, engages in all kinds of different forms of design, has won over 300 awards of excellence, 
this is a poster for AIGA and Lander Associates in 2003. Morla is also the chief marketing officer for Design Within Reach, the modernist furniture company that we've mentioned. I think I mentioned before the husband and wife photographer designer team of Scullos and Waddell. This is a spread from a book on guitars. They are interesting combination because one is a designer and one is a photographer. You can see how, you know, images move in and out of space in their work. This is another one of those, Scolas and Waddell. They say they're trying to diminish the boundaries between photography and design. So Michael Beirut, who is one of the editors of our Looking Closer, textbook is a partner at Pentagram together with Paula Shear and others. This is a poster of Beirut designed for a symposium titled Seduction. And it was in fact a collaboration between Beirut as a designer and the calligrapher Marion Banshees. It's an interesting combination between the geometric grid and the flexible sinuous qualities of the calligraphy. The Swiss style or international typographic style is still evident in the work of Beirut. This is a Yale University School of Architecture lecture, one of a series that he has done. This is the 2002. Michael Beirut is in the Helvetica movie and one of the more humorous commentators in that movie. Michael Beirut did the redesign of the Verizon logo in 2015. It was one of those logos which were universally detested by most designers. Here's a quote from Armin Witt at Brand New. Vitt said, quote, Verizon has more than $127 billion in 2014 revenue, but more impressive than any of those numbers is the apocryphal amount of designers who name the old Verizon logo as one of the worst, one of the most despised, one of the biggest affronts to our visual culture. Citing a, quote, renewed purpose at Verizon instead of just because designers think our logo is shit, we've designed blah, blah, blah. Verizon introduced yesterday a new logo designed by New York-based Pentagram partner Michael Beirut. Also, another quote by Armin Witt at Brand New, April of 2015. Yesterday, Hillary Clinton announced her candidacy and launched her campaign with a logo designed by Pentagram partner Michael Beirut. In less than 24 hours, Twitter and the news outlets have already gone berserk with reactions to the logo. Michael Beirut said, It's a great assignment because thanks largely to Barack Obama's successful use of a great design, Candidates, for the most part, understand that they have to worry about graphic design to communicate effectively. From how you design a rally attended by thousands to how you design a tiny icon for social media. At the same time, the expectations seem much higher. Even though no one votes for a logo, thanks to today's round-the-clock news coverage, a candidate's logo may get as much attention as a major policy statement. And it's unnerving when the haters start piling on for whatever reason. Interestingly, seven or eight years ago, long before these two controversial logos appeared, Michael Beirut wrote an essay on Design Observer titled Graphic Design, Criticism as a Spectator Sport. 
Beirut imagined a backyard conversation between his father and a neighbor occurring in 1969 when his neighbor asked his father if he had seen the new packaging for Tropicana orange juice. His father, baffled by the question, says no. When the neighbor starts complaining, you know, how they've changed the design. They took out the straw and the orange. I can't believe that you didn't notice that. Of course, this is an imaginary conversation taking place in 69, and as such, it is an absolutely incredulous conversation. But today, it's quite common. As the title says, graphic design has now become a spectator sport. Michael Beirut goes on, First in logo design, people prefer complicated things to simple things. Simple things look too easy to do, and it baffles people that professionals must be enlisted to design something simple, like the USA Today logo, which is basically a blue circle. How much did they pay for this? And my four-year-old could do this. Our response is so predictable, you wonder if they've hardwired into people's brains. It's ironic that as we conclude this chapter titled The Digital Revolution, we're doing so with the recognition that there has been a tremendous interest in letterpress printing the last 10, 15 years. We've had very good representation of that at this school. We have the book arts program and letterpress lab in the library and local printers who also specialize in letterpress printing. This is the work of Brady Vest, who founded Hammer Press in Kansas City. With just one press and one cabinet of type, this is a concert poster he did for Yola Tango. In Nashville, Tennessee, the famed Hatch Showprint is likely the oldest continuous running letterpress shop in the United States starting in 1879. It has been the musician's go-to company for printing show posters for practically everybody. As they say, from Elvis Presley to Elvis Costello. This happens to be a collection of posters I own, printed by Hatch Show Print. The manager and chief designer at Hat Showprint is Jim Sheridan, and he produces monotypes using existing blocks and plates and old beat-up movable type. This is six-panel rodeo from 1996. And another one is Jim Sheridan's 2008. These pieces are obviously not concert posters, but instead fine art, produced with the same material and on the same equipment as the concert posters. All right, we're going to end this lecture and the entire semester with a quote from our own Park City-based designer, John Plunkett, formerly of Wired Magazine. And this statement is about Plunkett's design for a print-based medium Wired Magazine, but it reflects the most frequent topic of that publication, the Internet. It represents the analog digital world that we all live in now. We're trying to create visual metaphors on a static printed page to represent the opposite, the electronic, nonlinear, infinitely malleable nature of the net. We've e we're equally interested in the eerie perfection of computer-generated images and low-tech, broad, handmade imagery, high-tech, high-touch. So almost every day you learn of new technologies, capabilities, or services that you hadn't heard of before. Graphic design, like many other spheres of human activities, undergoing profound changes due to technology. The tools, as has happened so often in the past, are changing, but the essence of graphic design 
remains unchanged. That essence is an ability to bring visual form to ideas and concepts and to bring order and clarity to information. And so I think we end where we began, whether scribing on clay tablets or composing on your laptop, the purpose is the same. Thank you. It's been a good class. Beirut continues, the basic starting point of graphic design criticism as a spectator sport is, I could have done better. And of course you could, but simply having the idea is not enough. Crafting a beautiful solution is not enough. Doing a dramatic presentation is not enough. Convincing all your peers is not enough. Even if you've done all that, you still have to go through the hard work of selling it to the client. And like any business situation of any complexity, that process may be smothered in politics, handicapped with exigencies, and beset with factors that have nothing to do with design excellence. You know, it's real life. Creating a beautiful design turns out to be just the first step in a long, perilous process with no guarantee of success. Perhaps the question in these logo discussions could be more than, could I do better? Perhaps we could also ask, what was the purpose? What was the process? Whose ends were being served? How should we judge success? But we seldom look any deeper than just our first impression, wallowing instead in a charming maelstrom of snap judgments. Should we be surprised when the general public jumps right in after us? So Michael Beirut had absolutely nothing to do with this Tropicana packaging. He was simply writing in response to the trend of criticizing graphic design. Interestingly for Tropicana, just two months after the introduction of this new packaging, sales had dropped 20% and they reverted back to the original packaging with the straw and the orange. The decrease in sales represented a loss of $30 million for Tropicana. By the 1990s, an explosion really of digital typefaces had occurred. Both large type vendors as well as small independent type manufacturers I remember a time early in my career when I prided myself on the ability of being able to identify the name of any typeface my associates could ask me. Those days are long, long gone. There's an overwhelming number of typefaces available today. Adobe Systems took the lead in the development of a lot of digital typefaces. Staff designers Robert Slumbach and Carl Twombly created both original designs as well as very highly respected digital adaptations such as Garamond and Jensen. Adobe, together with other designers, released Stone, Charlemagne, Lithos, Trajan, and the first multiple master typeface where two masters combined to make many different options. Ed Fella treats typographical elements as just floating bits of information. His hand-drawn typography references its own form and its own history. This is a mailer for a Detroit gallery in 1987. Here's the finished poster. Combining with video and print technologies, layering and overlapping of computer bitmap. This is 1988. Most design firms owned a stat camera. This was used for reducing and enlarging line art, like logos or headlines. You worked in a dark room with just a safe light. You'd crank these handles up and down to get the right distance from the original to an optically resized version on the top piece of glass, on which you would then place a photosensitive p 
piece of paper. You turn on the camera, light, camera lights for a few seconds and develop your own paper in a messy, smelly chemical processor. You'd hang it up to dry, and you did all that just to make a logo or a headline a little bit larger or a little bit smaller. I remember selling my stat camera in 1989 to a kind of unprogressive designer who couldn't see the writing on the wall about the soon-to-be digital era that was coming upon us. 